Uh, so uh, we'll go on then to Anna Garcia. I might take a few minutes more too because of English is not my mother tongue. So I thanks first to uh, Greg, Fred, and, and Steve, the organizers, for inviting me. Leo, I feel that is very special for me to be here. That's why I'm a little bit nervous because I don't take it really for granted. When I come to New York, every time I come here, I feel very at home, I feel very comfortable, I feel very happy. Uh, when I met, uh, I met Leo first at the World Social Forum in Caracas 2006, but he didn't meet me, uh, he didn't know me at that time. And then a uh, few years later, two years later, uh, 2008, uh, I got you know, an announcement in my university in Brazil uh, of a, a, a scholarship to Canada. So I wrote to Leo, he makes fun about it <laughs> to me every time. We talk about it. I wrote to him, I was in the international relations department in Brazil, and I said to him, yeah, I want to go uh, to New York to learn more and to go deeper into this new Gramscian analysis of <laughs> international relations. And he said, yeah, okay, come here. And he uh, welcomed me here. He gave me the keys of his office and all that, supported me every time. Uh, and then I found out <laughs> that it was very different, of course. Then, uh, you know, there's this comparative politics area, and then IR with uh, Cox and Stephen Gill. Uh, anyways, uh, the time I spent here at York uh, was fundamental to uh, my intellectual uh, life, to my personal life. Uh, it was not a coincidence that right in that time, I, well, I was working on this for, for my militant work, my political work, but uh, the time I spent here, uh, brought me to the question that I was, you know, making and then put, a, a, a put it theoretically in my PhD that time uh, on the question of the state, on the question of uh, multinationals, and then the question of the states from, uh, if you can say that, the periphery, the, the Brazilian state, uh, emerging multinationals, and the coincidence was in that, in that same year, 2009, uh, as uh, Vale, the Brazilian mining company, was already in Canada, uh, the steel workers started the hugest, uh, largest, longest uh, strike they had in their history. Uh, and I was uh, already in contact with the steel workers here. I was working already uh, uh, on the topic of Brazilian multinationals. Mm -hmm. And it was a coincidence that I was here uh, in the PhD in that time, and, uh, and, and I could you know, follow closely the, the, the strike that was just starting and then one year later we did this very big meeting with valley affected people and workers from all over the world. So it really had you know some importance in my life after the time that I spent here. Um, what I wanted to say before I was asked uh, to be here to talk about the BRICS, so I'm coming to my topic. But what I wanted to say first that I was thinking that uh, the reception of Leo's and Sam's work after it was translated to Portuguese and Spanish in Latin America after Claxo and Natilio Baron translated it, uh, the register in 2004 uh, was huge. So that Leo was even invited for the uh, uh, School of the Leninist <coughs> Movement, the MSD, so people had access to it, people could read in academia and outside of the academia. And I think that uh, it is very important to, 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 to notice this. Why? Uh, it is very uh, central to the Brazilian left and the left in Latin America in general, uh, the question of American imperialism. I think that uh, we in Latin America feel uh, American imperialism in our everyday life, so as Canadians do, I think that is uh, interesting to notice. Even though, of course, in Latin America, we feel more the coercive side, at least uh, in the Cold War period, but also after. So for the left in Latin America, and I think that's also the reason why Lewis and Sam's work was so, uh, had uh, this big reception there, uh, is that the question of uh, uh, anti-imperialism means almost automatically an anti-America feeling, so that the whole theory of the American informal empire uh, came very well, fit very well, to the left strategies of that period, um, in the 2000s, but also now. Uh, but what, uh, what is missing that is uh, a 
really deeper understanding of imperialism uh, within or, or, or as a, a, a configuration, a specific configuration of capitalism. There is a sort of weird separation or dissociation of imperialism seen from a more state-centric geopolitical uh, uh, phenomenon and not within capitalism and of class struggles. And that's why I think when you come to talk about China or the BRICS within and not outside of American empire, uh, it is so confusing for, for the Brazilian left uh, and uh, uh, professors and intellectuals too, not only in the social movement. Uh, we uh, in Brazil had last year, Leo was there, uh, an event called in International Relations and Marxism, <laughs> which is not very common elsewhere, uh, we invited Leo and we gathered many, many people together. And then I was asked uh, a little bit later after that to write a chapter. There was this book series in Brazil called Theorists of International Relations, so that we would write about those uh, uh, main characters that would inform and, and influence international relations theory. So I was asked to write about Leo Pandich <laughs> as a theorist of international relations. Uh, the book is coming out soon. I just finished the chapter. And, and then, <laughs> of course, I said, let's see what I can write and how to reflect upon uh, international relations from Leo's and, and Sam's. I have to always mention Sam because Sam is uh, one of the authors of the main works uh, that inform those analysis of, of global capitalism. Uh, so the two main topics that I chose for that chapter was uh, the reflection upon the state, the capitalist state, and not seen, of course, as a, a, a monolithic, coherent agent as international relations normally sees. Uh, so to, to reflect upon the nature and the functions of the state and market, and to, reflection upon, uh, to reflect upon imperialism, how to see imperialism as a new configuration and, 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 and new mechanism in the 20th century that is different from international relations uh, optic or, or, or view of imperialism from the 19th century or the uh, 20th century. So what I did was uh, I wrote on the internationalization of well, what the, what the concept that I chose for the chapter. The internationalization of the state, of production and of finance, so those three, and then from that, uh, the American informal empire, this whole concept, this whole idea, uh, the integration of Europe to it, of Japan, and of China to American informal empire. And this is very important to the way that I then come to analyze uh, the BRICS. So to the conception of the internationalization of the state, that is different than uh, uh, the concept that Robert Cox had, uh, that Leo draws uh, from Poulances. Um, what uh, was very uh, important to, 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 to bring and to try to summarize for the Brazilian public uh, right now is that uh, Leo uh, criticizes Cox in the way that he puts it as a process from the outside in, from pressures of the world market to the state that changes the hierarchies of states' agencies, those, who, uh, those which uh, deals directly with the world market gets you know, more power than others that deal with the social sectors, all of that. Uh, and drawing on, on, on Colonsas, Leos uh, uh, come to the point that it's, it's not about a, a hierarchy of agencies, but the transformations of the very agencies uh, that deal with, that are collect, uh, connected with labor and social services that are restructured in the logic of capital accumulation so that the process is not uh, something that, that is so simple and so, so simplistic a uh, way to understand. And the internationalization of the state has to do directly with uh, the internationalization of the American state and the, the making of globalization in the 20th century uh, as a uh, uh, century that was uh, 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 so marked by the, uh, the American Empire. So the internationalization of the state uh, in the way that Leo and Sam uh, pose in the, in the book that is not there, but I thought it would, um, means the process uh, through which states 
uh, encourage and support capitalists to carry their activities, their activities abroad and uh, maintaining its national dimensions. And in the interaction with foreign capital and the effects that it has on domestic social forces, this contributes in turn uh, to generate a combination of inside and outside pressures through which states come to accept the responsibility to reproducing capitalism internationally. So this is very important because states not only in the center as the American state is, but also in the periphery, they take more and more responsibility in promoting, in facilitating, in structuring capital accumulation abroad and inside. And that's the process that I think uh, uh, it's the main contribution. All of this, of course, contributed to America's ability of uh, managing capitalism globally. Um, so this is the political dimension that is connected uh, to the economic one, which is the uh, uh, internationalization of production and finance uh, in terms of production and the expansion of American multinationals. Uh, which is also uh, connected to the expansion of other states uh, and, and not state or the private also multinationals. What I think it's uh, important to highlight is how these uh, economic actors have also very strong uh, political effects in terms of building new institutions, uh, uh, pushing for new laws such as national treatment, uh, free uh, uh, movement of, of, of capital, regimes of tariffs and, and exchange, and how they change you know, the, the infrastructure inside other states in order to operate more freely uh, for, uh, for their own accumulation. And in the question of international finance, how uh, you know, the dollar, the US dollars uh, play a huge role, uh, be it in Europe or, or in the BRICS countries, U.S. Treasury bonds, and especially how uh, U.S. finance set the rules and regulated, not regulated uh, uh, finance worldwide still today. Oops, okay, <laughs> sorry. So the whole question of management of global capitalism and management of crisis uh, uh, is what I feel that is very important to, to take from Leo's and Sam's uh, theoretical framework to understand how it changes uh, or not changes or make it more difficult when it comes to the question of, of the so-called emerging uh, powers, the new emerging countries. Uh, to the American uh, informal empire and the integration of Europe, Japan, and then China, what is, uh, I think, very uh, uh, courageous of Sam and, and Leo that is not very common in other uh, places left uh, intellectuals is how they uh, critique and, and you know, contradict the classicals, uh, Lenin and all, and Rosa, uh, to say, uh, well, you're wrong. You're wrong in that period, you're wrong now, <laughs> which is not very common, and you don't see the, the left saying this very frequently. Uh, but what they uh, contradict in the, the common sense is the idea of uh, emerging uh, powers, emerging countries being uh, rivals or the re-emergence of uh, uh, inter-imperial rivalry among states as they did for the case of the European Union and how you can now analyze uh, emerging powers as, such as China. Um, so the whole definition of imperialism for the 20th century is very important, which is the way that the United States was capable to penetrate and coordinate other leading states and turning these states capitalists the, in the way that would manage to uh, set the juridical, the political, the economic infrastructure for capital accumulation, being that American capital or not, or being their own capital, or being other states' capital. So this is uh, very, very important to understand why uh, Europe, Japan, and then China were integrated into this and not uh, uh, against it or not, an, or not an alternative or not a rival uh, uh, to this. Uh, so the integration of Europe and Japan, they've, you know, Sam and Leo uh, 
really described it and, and analyzed it very, very deeply in, in the book. And for the case of China, uh, have you know a few things that Leo wrote uh, I put together and and started to you know analyze from my own perspective. Well, in a sense, uh, it's a big question of how to manage uh, capitalism and how to manage the outcome of of financial crisis since the 1990s and then especially the 2008 crisis. So uh, in that perspective of American informal empire, um, okay. <laughs> China and other BRICS as well, but especially China, uh, did not emerge uh, as a challenge, but in, in, of course it sets uh, some tensions, it sets some uh, 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 ways of economic competition, but not a challenge and of course not a counter hegemonic opposition to it as some of the left want to say, but they were integrated especially through the widespread and hierarchically spread uh, 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 production in, in the in the Asian. Uh, this, the role of the dollar is very important here too, and the whole question of how the states could organize their own uh, uh, conditions in their own territories and their own rules in order to guarantee capital accumulation. Uh, there is no sign now, or no will at least now shown by China or Russia or anyone uh, of these emerging countries that they would uh, take responsibility of managing the world uh, uh, capitalist crisis the way that America did so far, especially coordinating it through uh, the G7 and then lately the G20. So let me quickly come to just two minutes more to a few points that I want to raise that I think it's uh, important to, to to analyze the BRICS from uh, that whole idea that I you know, take from Leo and Sam's work. First, uh, to see how uh, the images of the BRICS countries and, and, and China come out of these integrated networks of manufacturing and production that strongly need their states, be either the host states or the, the, the states of origin uh, to make that work. So this whole connection, this whole connection of integrated trade and uh, uh, production uh, that really uh, brought China and other BRICS countries uh, to grow so fast as they did in the last uh, decades and to go through this whole intensive process of modernization of their institutions, of their multinationals, of their mechanisms, state mechanisms in order to to really promote, in order to really push forward uh, their accumulation processes from inside and to the outside. So these are uh, credit mechanisms, all kinds of support of state mechanisms, all kinds <coughs> of support of labor laws that really can keep workers uh, in their own uh, territory nationalized while <coughs> capital is internationalizing. So this very proactive role of the US states in making capitalism work that way really influenced directly the way China and also other uh, BRICS countries uh, <coughs> act towards their own companies as I did uh, analyze the, the, the case of Brazil. So in that way, uh, some specificities, just I know that I, I'm over my time. Uh, what, I, what I also uh, take from Leo and Sam's work is the way that these states, uh, in, in order to promote, to, to develop their instrument of, 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 of uh, support of their uh, uh, foreign uh, direct investment, how they mix public and private interests, representing private interests of their multinational corporations as public <coughs> ones, as interests of the whole society, as national interests, which is very problematic. And it's one uh, of the ways that I've been uh, criticizing towards the left. Not, I, you know, it's not a, a question of, of, of you know, telling this to everyone who already knows it, but the left and the left in Brazil really has difficulties in seeing 
that having big multinationals such as Vale and others uh, is not a question of having our own or our, our national uh, multinationals abroad or our national interests being represented, uh, but the way that the Brazilian states and also other emerging country states represent it, it's very important as a new sort of stage of development. And that touches in this very deep-rooted <coughs> idea of modernization and develop that is so uh, 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 set in the left uh, in those countries. So the promise, uh, those, the so-called promise of economic development, the different paths to reach development, um, has influenced many of the intellectuals in the left uh, and many of, uh, of you know, uh, political projects and governments today. Uh, so, to you know, to come to an end now, uh, the dissociation uh, of democracy and, and, and capitalism is not new at all. So, in our countries, what we're living in now today, uh, you know, th that you know, the combination of capitalism and authoritarianism is something that has you know been always there in countries in Latin America. The bourgeoisie Latin America has always needed a very strong state and that's why this uh, relationship with the military is so marked in the Latin American history because they need on the one hand to promote their <coughs> interests, to promote uh, 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 their uh, modernization process in the way that capitalism sets it. On the other hand, they cannot uh, uh, let it go to a national, uh, a national uh, uh, revolution. So they have to keep the working class really uh, under control. Um, so that I think, so I mean, I'm really finishing, that we have many, um, many uh, ways and many faces uh, of struggles in that sense, uh, uh, looking to, to, to uh, the BRICS and emerging countries. One is the concrete struggles on the shop floor, on the territories and communities. One uh, is the very idea and this ideological uh, uh, concept of developmentalism that is so you know, rooted in the left that you cannot even fight just for you to have an idea. When we were having this coup d'etat in Brazil last year, you know, everyone was just, you know, they were dismantling everything uh, very smart, very good leading uh, uh, militants, intellectuals were saying that the coup d'etat in Brazil was against the BRICS. <laughs> so this is something that you have to go back and say, where is this from? Right? And that's uh, one of the reasons, the very idea of this deeply rooted imaginary of development. And then to really end up, is the whole idea of anti-imperialism being anti-America, anti-US imperialism. It should be, but it should be also anti-capitalism. And, and that is not always there, and that's why I think it is so important to reflect upon the BRICS from that anti-capitalist perspective. I'm very sorry. <laughs>